world founded upon four essential human freedoms. A park and a memorial inspired by one of the most stirring speeches. Freedom of speech and expression. There's a force to it and a strength to it. From one of our greatest presidents. Freedom of every person to worship God in his own way. FDR saw America's role as larger than it had been. Freedom from want, freedom from fear. An architectural wonder that almost didn't happen. They thought they were gonna do it, it fell apart. For Freedom's Park, a momentous challenge for the activists who dreamed it and the builders who worked under trying conditions to make it real. Now brought to life on the island that bears President Roosevelt's name. I just feel like taking a bullhorn and telling everybody they have to go out there. This program is made possible by Karina Endowment Fund, Dyson Foundation, Anne and Vincent May, and Bernard and Irene Schwartz. From Four Freedoms Park, here's historian Douglas Brinkley. If ever there were a president fit to honor with an architecturally stunning memorial in the heart of New York City, surely it is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was a native New Yorker who served as governor here. His New Deal programs financed buildings, parks, and highways in and around the city. And he fought tirelessly for the creation of the United Nations right along the East River. Today, an extraordinary monument to his legacy exists, fittingly here on Roosevelt Island. Four Freedoms Park is named for FDR's sobering 1941 speech that reshaped our view of America's role in the world. But this place is not austere. It's a vibrant park and a breathtaking structure designed by one of the 20th century's greatest architects. The story of how this site went from landfill to landmark could fill a history book of its own. A series of obstacles were overcome through brilliant design, innovative construction, and the fierce belief of an energetic band of Roosevelt loyalists that memorializing FDR in the right way and the right place was worth the effort. People who have come to it who are architects or students of any background talk of it in, in spiritual terms. Four Freedoms Park is a proud memorial to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the New York governor and four-term U.S. president who skillfully guided New York and the nation through the worst domestic crisis and the worst foreign crisis of the 20th century. A New York monument to honor an iconic leader who launched his career here might seem like a natural idea, but making this park a reality was itself a monumental task, requiring decades of relentless advocacy and an ambitious building and landscaping effort. We'll show you exclusive footage of a construction project that was daunting even to the city's best builders. You're working here on a very narrow island weight of these blocks have never been installed um, in this city before, and we had a very big challenge. The force behind Four Freedoms Park is a former ambassador to the United Nations, Bill Vanden Heuvel. A prominent figure in New York political and business circles, Vanden Heuvel has been pushing for an FDR memorial since he came to the city in the 1960s. But his emotional bond to President Roosevelt goes back much further. My father, on his shoulders took me to the railroad station in 1936 to see Franklin Roosevelt arrive in one of the torchlight parades. Vanden Heuvel's family were poor immigrants from Holland and Belgium who believed FDR was the man to protect and defend their American dream. I idealized, I'm sure, uh, as a young boy would. I began campaigning for the Roosevelt tradition and for the Roosevelt legacy when I was 10 years old. As a boy in Rochester, New York, Vanden Heuvel was inspired by Roosevelt, a man who had survived a devastating bout of polio and become a popular take charge governor. The depression hit in the middle of Franklin Roosevelt's governorship and he uh, really alone among American governors decided that the state government could help people. With food lines across the state, 
and Hoovervilles springing up even in Central Park, New Yorkers needed help. Roosevelt lowered utility rates, reduced taxes, and created a state agency to aid the unemployed. When he was elected president in 1932, FDR enacted an even more ambitious plan for the nation's economic recovery. The New Deal provided unemployment compensation and assistance to the poor, elderly, and disabled. New Deal programs like the Works Progress Administration created more than 12 million jobs. He didn't think there were any problems that couldn't be solved, especially if he was in charge. <laughs> the problems confronting Roosevelt would only get more daunting. Hitler, Mussolini, and Hirohito were expanding their empires across the globe. Roosevelt's most vitriolic opponents preached strict isolationism. Do not let your minds be poisoned by the propaganda of the warmongers who are not interested in the welfare of the common people as much as they are interested in maintaining their international financial control. There are a lot of people who hated him, lunatics who thought he was the, the mouthpiece for the Jews, people who resented his having won a third term. They thought he was lying about Europe. For his State of the Union in 1941, Roosevelt prepared a bold response, his famous Four Freedoms speech. Because at no previous time has American security been as seriously threatened from without as it is today. Freedom means the supremacy of human rights everywhere. All our support goes to those who struggle to gain those rights and keep them. Less than a year later, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and the U.S. entered the war, the Four Freedom Speech became a rallying cry. Roosevelt never got to see the victory his wartime leadership made possible. In April 1945, not long before the war's end, the president died at his retreat in Warm Springs, Georgia. Aboard a special train beginning the 24-hour trip back to Washington, the 31st President of the United States leaves Warm Springs forever. And all along the 700-mile route, people gather to honor President Roosevelt and his ideals. A whole generation of people had never had another president. The, the word president meant Roosevelt. It really was as if the father had died in a family. The grief that was suffered in the nation could certainly be expressed for the terrible grief in our household when Franklin Roosevelt died. Bill Vanden Heuvel's high school classmates all knew about his devotion to the president. They took up a collection for bus fare so he could travel to FDR's funeral at the president's second home in Hyde Park, New York. But when the teenager arrived there, there were no spaces left for students. So at that point, Mrs. Roosevelt was coming from the house. And I ran over to her and said, Mrs. Roosevelt, I've come 400 miles to be here today. Please let me stay. The First Lady agreed to the teenager's request, and young Bill Vanden Heuvel attended the funeral along with hundreds of leaders, like President Truman and General George Marshall. As Vanden Heuvel grew to be a man, Serving in the U.S. Air Force and graduating from Cornell Law School, FDR's example continued to inspire him. In the 1950s and 60s, he became involved in democratic politics and the civil rights movement, serving as an assistant to U.S. Attorney General Robert Kennedy. In the 1970s, Jimmy Carter named him an ambassador to the United Nations, the organization FDR had dreamed of and his widow helped realize. The object is to make people everywhere conscious of the importance of human rights and freedoms. Throughout his career, Vanden Heuvel made preserving the Roosevelt legacy a top priority. In 1973, he attended a ceremony on what was then Welfare Island, a narrow strip of land on the East River between Manhattan and Queens, where New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller and New York City Mayor John Lindsay renamed the space Roosevelt Island and announced plans to build a monument in honor of the 32nd president. 
An architect was chosen to design the project, Louis Kahn. Kahn was in a sense an obvious choice. Uh, he had achieved the highest levels of the profession. In 1972, he got the AIA gold medal, the American Institute of Architects' highest recognition for individual uh, achievement. Kahn was also a lifelong admirer of President Roosevelt. My father uh, loved FDR for so many reasons. My father was an immigrant coming to this land of opportunity, but he lived in pretty serious poverty in Philadelphia. Kahn's connection to FDR was deepened by personal experience. He got his start in the Depression era in an architecture program created by Roosevelt's Works Progress Administration. And that was when architects didn't have work. Suddenly, uh, you know, Roosevelt's idea that there was all this great untapped potential in America. There is greatness within all of us. We just need a chance to bring it out. Kahn went on to design masterpieces that were bold and imposing, drawing inspiration from ancient ruins. His best-known works include the Salk Institute in California, the Yale Center for British Art, and the National Assembly Building in Bangladesh. His son still remembers Kahn's excitement when the Roosevelt Island assignment came through. To build a memorial to beloved President Roosevelt in New York City, on an island recently renamed for Roosevelt in the state which gave birth to Roosevelt as a political figure. Oh, it was the commission of a lifetime and he took it very, very seriously. Kahn's design was both a grand monument and a tranquil park. In his drawings and models, a set of granite steps leads to a point-shaped lawn with rows of trees on either side. At the tip of the point stands a bronze bust of Roosevelt and beyond that, what Kahn called the room, imposing stone walls under an open sky. I remember my father working over these dimensions of the, of the blocks. He was constantly trying to figure out how far apart those stones should be. Should they be an inch? Should they be a foot? You know, what, what was that dimension? And I think he was looking for this sort of point where they would just vibrate with, with energy. But excitement around the project soon turned to disappointment. In 1974, Nelson Rockefeller, a key supporter of the memorial as governor, moved to Washington to become vice president in the midst of the Watergate scandal. That same year, architect Louis Kahn died suddenly of a heart attack in Penn Station. The financial crisis that socked the city soon after put discretionary projects like the FDR memorial on the back burner. So what was anticipated to be a $9 million project in 1973 lay on the table untouched for a long number of years. There was talk of reviving the plan in the 1980s and again in the 90s, but it went nowhere. Still, Vanden Heuvel wasn't about to let the idea die. Over the years, others joined him in the effort. One of the most ardent would be a woman raised in a Republican family in Bedford, New York. The former Toby Stevenson hadn't followed the efforts to build an FDR memorial until she met his son, Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr., at a charity event in the early 1980s. He came across the room, put his hand out, and he said, Hello, I'm Franklin D. Roosevelt Jr. And it was just instant something happened between us. The couple married, and Stevenson became Mrs. FDR Jr. By then, her husband was in his 70s, and beginning to think more seriously about his father's legacy. He revered his father so much, and he was very close to him. And he thought four freedoms was very important for everyone to notice and pass on, so to speak, to other generations. Each year, the Roosevelts attended an international ceremony marking the four freedoms. When they traveled to Holland to speak at the 1988 event, Roosevelt was still suffering the impact of a serious accident. He stood up in front of the Queen and said, this will be my last trip to the Netherlands, and I'm removing my mantle and placing it on my wife's shoulders. Well, of course, <laughs> that was quite a weight put on me. FDR Jr. died a few months later. I'm in a position to carry on for him, and I try to do projects that would 
be of his interest. And this park was something he very much was hoping would be built. Louis Kahn's youngest son shared the hope that the New York Roosevelt Memorial, his father's final architectural design, could become a reality. Nathaniel Kahn, who was only 11 when his dad died, had grown up to be a filmmaker. In the late 1990s, he began working on a documentary about his father's life and work. Through making the film, I found out a lot about him, both as an architect and as a person. The film, called My Architect, was released in 2003. From the very beginning, he was after symmetry, order, geometric clarity, primitive power, enormous weight. In researching his father's blueprints, Khan came across a treasure trove of designs that had never been built. The Dominican Sisters Convent, the U.S. Consulate in Luanda, Angola, the City Tower Project, the Pocono... So many great projects. These were things he loved and things he worked on for sometimes years that didn't happen. The Baltimore Inner Harbor Development... One of the most beautiful of the unbuilt masterworks? The Roosevelt Memorial in New York City. Nathaniel Kahn's film drew rave reviews and was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary. We saw many more people visiting the collection here, wanting to visit Kahn's buildings, arrange for tours. Young Kahn's film gave the Memorial Project momentum it had never had before. A young New York architect named Gina Polara was commissioned to co-curate an exhibit at Cooper Union about the project by the architect she greatly admired. Louis Kahn um, was always really considered an architect's architect. Almost every single project that he built is a masterpiece. The exhibit prompted major contributions towards the memorial, and Polara was selected as the architect to realize Kahn's vision. Advertising executive Sally Menard came on board as president of the project. I mean, the whole idea of a con design, of a memorial to FDR, of something in the middle of New York City, it was so exciting. So we had to raise $50 million in the greatest recession since the Depression. So that was a challenge. We just kept approaching the hurdles and clearing the hurdles and facing the next hurdle. Plans for construction of the project, now called Four Freedoms Park, began in earnest. It was thrilling, but it also suddenly gets very scary because you think, well, how's it going to turn out? Oh, I remember having a panic. On site, things were not exactly as they looked on paper. And Gina says parts of Khan's design puzzled her. I remember speaking to a former classmate of mine from Cooper saying, you know, I, what, I don't know, what is this? She just said, trust Khan. You have to trust Khan. In early 2010, workers broke ground on Four Freedoms Park now a $53 million project. A significant amount of time was devoted to the logistics plan in terms of how logistically you would build this, given that you're on an island, given that you're facing some of the strongest currents on the eastern seaboard. The first step, laying a foundation, proved to be one of the most difficult. The foundation at the tip of the island had to be built below water, so we actually had to use a sort of steel sheathing to, to hold back the water. It was a temporary dam. At times, we were like eight to 10 foot below the river. When there were extreme high tides, you know, the water would come right over the top of the dam. To handle construction of the room at the tip of the island, the team hired Port Morris Tiles. The company had done the stonework on huge projects, like Yankee Stadium and the 9-11 Memorial. But this park presented bigger challenges. To be honest, it scared me a little bit. We opened up the, the drawings. I, I won't forget that day. And I said to my boss, I said, you know, I don't know if this is for us. And he turned to me and he said, if it's not for Port Morris, it's not going to be for anybody. Vespa traveled to a quarry in North Carolina to select the finest granite, 12 million pounds worth. So it's perfect, every, every single piece. The 59th Street Bridge can only handle 30 tons at a time, and Port Morris needed to bring in columns weighing up to 36 tons. So the granite was trucked to New Jersey, then taken to the site by barge. Not unlike shipping the huge stones up the Nile to build the pyramids. Uh, I mean, it was really the same brick by brick, block by, by block technique that was used here to build this, this project. Mrs. FDR Jr 
one of the project's biggest supporters for a quarter century, visited the construction site as often as she could. When the first 36-ton block arrived by barge and the men were hoisting it onto the park and setting it in place, it was just total excitement. In an earlier era, it's just the sort of project the Works Progress Administration would have taken on. About 100 trained stone setters positioned 70 massive stones in the room and 260,000 smaller stones throughout the site. Landscapers planted 120 little leaf linden trees in perfectly aligned rows. A foundry created a rubber mold of Roosevelt's head and filled it with molten bronze to create the six-foot bust. Stone artist Nick Benson designed and hand-carved an inscription from the Four Freedom Speech on a column of granite. But just before the park was to open, one final hurdle, a legal dispute about where on the site two donors could have their names engraved. A New York State judge quickly ruled on the dispute, allowing the dedication to go forward. It's been a long and sometimes difficult struggle, but what a magnificent end. On October 17, 2012, almost three years after construction began, Bill Vandenhoevel, Mrs. FDR Jr., and other dignitaries cut the ribbon on Four Freedoms Park. I did not visualize what a magnificent work of art this was going to be. You could look at what Kahn had drawn, and you could look at what we were trying to do in memory of Franklin Roosevelt, but it all came together. And you go up that grand staircase, and you have nothing but granite in front of you. And you get up the stairs, and you pick up your head, and you look down that alley, the lawn and the trees, going down to the bust of FDR. And then you step through a court, and then into this room, and suddenly you've been prepared in this amazing way for the experience of space opening up, possibilities opening up, your own freedoms opening up. As familiar as I was with construction drawings and the design, there are all these amazing things that we discovered as we built the project. Details Lewis Kahn had labored over, like the one-inch spaces between the columns in the room that create slivers of light as the sun rises. In its first year, 130,000 visitors came to Four Freedoms. The park's founders are confident more will come, and many will come back. What brings people there is the beauty of the site. What brings them back again is the programming that we will plan. The conservancy which runs the park offers guided tours and organizes special cultural events. Nathaniel Kahn, whose father designed the memorial, hopes the next phase will be construction of a visitor center built in the ruins of a hospital near the park's entrance. We owe it to the world of architecture to do this next step at the highest level. From the time Four Freedoms Park was conceived, many New Yorkers could foresee its significance. The New York Times editorial board wrote that a memorial to Roosevelt on this site would face the sea he loved, the Atlantic he bridged, the Europe he helped save, and the United Nations he inspired. I think he would have appreciated its beauty and the, the fact that the United Nations is really the principal object of observation when you look at the island. It's his island in that sense. Freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. Freedom of every person to worship God in his own way everywhere in the world. Freedom from what means economic understanding which will secure to every nation a healthy peacetime life everywhere in the world. Freedom from fear means a worldwide reduction of armament to such a point that no nation will be in a position to commit an act of physical aggression against any neighbor anywhere in the world. 
Nearly 70 years since his death, New York finally has a memorial to an American president whose memory inspires the city and the world. To take us out of the Depression, to give us hope, to craft the alliance of nations that was able to defeat the worst barbarism in the recorded history of mankind, it's worth remembering. Standing in this space surrounded by the natural beauty of the East River, the elegant architecture of Louis Kahn and the inspirational words of FDR, it's not hard to understand what the advocates of Four Freedoms Park work so hard to achieve, or to feel the value of bringing history to life. I'm Douglas Brinkley. Thank you for joining us. This program is made possible by Karina Endowment Fund, Dyson Foundation, Anne and Vincent May, and Bernard and Irene Schwartz.